Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to be here at the first uh, Redmond and EMS Joint uh, Summit. I think it's a terrific thing to combine safety uh, and EMS together in this, in this joint event. It's really powerful. Uh, I also want to thank you on a personal level because I told my three-year-old son that I was coming to talk to firefighters today and he said, Mommy, can I come to work with you? He is not at all impressed by the White House, by the way, but he thought that coming to talk to firefighters was about the coolest thing that I could possibly be doing. So I just want to thank you on a personal note because it's always great as a parent to look cool in your kid's eyes and uh, I uh, really appreciated that moment I got with him last night. It got me thinking, though, about why kids in America want to grow up and be firefighters. And it's like a universal thing. Every other kid I talk to wants to be a firefighter. And, and I was wondering why that was. It was the trucks, of course, and those red fire hats we get at the fire stations. Those are pretty awesome. Uh, but I think it's a lot more than that, because I think it's what you represent in your community. It's service and safety and bravery and a relentless commitment to those values. And I think people respect that, and kids pick up on people respecting that. It's the values that we want to teach our kids, and, and uh, being able to, to reflect that and honor that is something that I think is really, really powerful. And I think kids want to, want to live up to that expectation, and they want to be heroes themselves. And it's pretty frustrating and disappointing when the bruising debates in Washington, Harold, you're all too familiar with this, uh, aren't really worthy of those values. And so I just want to take a minute to talk to you today on behalf of the President and the Vice President about where this administration stands and what we feel passionately about, and a little bit about public safety communications, which I think is an incredibly, incredibly important safety issue. When it comes to what we've seen in Washington in the last month, quite frankly, I do think my three-year-old has acted like more of a grown-up most of the time. And in the last year, in state after state, places like Arizona, New Hampshire, Ohio, Wisconsin, we've seen the most direct assault on public employees since the 1920s. The other side of this debate keeps on trying to blame state budget crunches not on too much risk being taken on Wall Street, not on the stuff that got us into this mess, but on you. They blame tight state budgets on collective bargaining when we know all too well that it's simply not the case. These attacks don't just affect your wages and benefits, they affect our family's safety and security. They affect the safety and security of your workplaces and of your colleagues, and it is simply unacceptable. So from the day the President and the Vice President took office, they've worked both to protect collective bargaining rights and save firefighter jobs. And they've never wavered in that commitment, and they're not going to now. It's why we invested more than a billion dollars since taking office in the Safer Hiring Grant Program, saving literally thousands of firefighters' jobs. And we, thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Harold, for your leadership on that. And, and, we, uh, and we did that in part in response to the real leadership that IAFF showed on that issue. So I really want to thank, you should thank your leadership and, and want to thank you for your commitment and support in getting that done. We understand that the flexibility that departments need in order to use those safer dollars effectively, and in this economy, in these circumstances, the need to use those dollars for retention and rehiring and to avoid layoffs, and we are committed to continuing to work with Congress in order to protect that flexibility, which we passed in the Recovery Act. And we finally enacted the 9-11 Health Compensation Act. Thank you again, for everybody in this room, for your leadership on that so that firefighters and, and rescue and recovery workers who responded on 9-11 have the access to the medical monitoring and treatment that they need and that they have earned. So I, I think we've made some progress. I want to talk a little bit today about a specific issue that, as Rich alluded to, I've been spending a lot of my time and energy on and the Vice President has been very dedicated to, and that's public safety broadband, which I think is a real safety issue. We are hard at work in this administration in trying to deploy a next generation public safety broadband network. It's an effort that will spur innovation and it will help the economy, but most importantly, it's going to put critical communications technology into the hands of firefighters and first responders, and law enforcement too, but we'll put them aside for a minute. Uh, we support, as an administration, both the investment that's required, about 
seven to ten billion dollars, and also the allocation of the D block for a dedicated public safety broadband use in a public safety network. It's critical for interoperability, but more importantly, it's critical for safety and operability. We know that technology breakdowns and glitches cost lives. 343 of our heroes on September 11th, and even more since then. I don't need to tell anybody in this room how critical the flow of information between firefighters and officers and other first responders is at a fire scene. That's why we've been planning with firefighters and working with you and with Rich directly and, and with IAFF to make sure that you're involved in developing the new system because it has to work for you. That has got to be the bottom line here. A lot of you have probably seen on TV that ad where the firefighter pulls up, it's very sanitized, and he pulls out of the air a building schematic, and it's really cool, and it looks really interactive, and that is actually one of the cool envisionings of what this wireless data capability is all about. But that's only part of the potential, and frankly, isn't completely realistic to the type of scenarios that you all frequently encounter. But imagine some other real possibilities of this kind of capability. Imagine an app that accurately pinpoints the real-time location of a firefighter inside a burning building so that even if you've lost sight of somebody, you've lost contact with somebody, you can locate them instantly and know exactly where they are. Imagine video and images from accident scenes that you can receive and also transmit ahead to emergency rooms. And ultimately, better, smaller, smarter communications devices that allow for clear communications even in the chaos of a fire, so that if a mayday call or an evacuation call comes in, it is heard. There is nothing more critical than that kind of technology at your fingertips. But we can't build that kind of hardened network, that kind of nationwide transformational technology that we need to bring into the hands of public safety without federal investment. So that's one of the debates we're having right now in this big budget debate in Washington. And we're going to continue having it over the next few months. We're making some progress with a strongly bipartisan bill in the Senate. And we need to do uh, more with the House. I'm not going to beat around the bush. There are plenty of people, as uh, I think President Clinton and President Schaeberger alluded to in his remarks, that don't think we can afford to make this kind of investment. That they don't, they don't think we should give the D-block to public safety. They don't think we is the time for us to be making these kinds of long-term investments in our safety and security. And I tell those people, look, the 10th anniversary of 9-11 is less than a month away. And we have still not solved this critical communications problem. And we now have the opportunity to do it. We owe it to you to get this fixed. And this administration, with your input, is going to continue working on getting that job done until you have the technology to get your job done. So we're making some progress on communications. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, we also know that there's a, a bigger issue here uh, as an administration. The most important thing we can do for you is to get our economy growing faster, creating more jobs, so that we can ease the budget crunch on state and local governments. That's why the president has called for extending the payroll tax cut to put money back into the pockets of middle class families. It's one of those tax cuts that people got that the pres President Clinton alluded to that nobody knows they got. We want to keep that going. Uh, extending unemployment insurance for those who are still looking for work. Continuing investments in our infrastructure and education. Which actually brings me back to where I started, which is our values. The vice president, my boss, has an expression that I love a lot. He says, show me your budget, and I'll show you your values, what you think is valuable, what you think is your priority. And I think the political debates in Washington make one thing abundantly clear. That there are real differences in priorities. On one side, there are those who think it is somehow uh, makes sense to further chip away at the financial security of American families by cutting Medicare, education, retirement, and coming after public employees. Those are the folks who, who believe there really isn't any room for making investments that will make our communities safer and more secure. Not just education or health care, but also things like the fire and safer grants and next generation public safety communications. And I am here to assure you that that is not where this administration's values lie. 
We believe in honoring those who serve our country and making sure you have what you need to get your job done. We believe that your rights, including your right to collectively bargain, should be protected. We believe that our country's economic strength lies with families being secure and strong, and, and that being secure and strong means doing better than just getting by. And we believe that fundamentally, families, the middle class of this country, are the economic engine that drives our economy. That's why the President has put forward proposals to get our deficits under control that don't come out of the hides of our families. And that's really what our values are. So I'll leave you with, with the same thought I started with, which is really this is at, at the end of the day about our kids and making sure that they grow up in the same kind of communities uh, that, that we have today, communities that are secure in a country that is strong. And, uh, and to thank you, really, for holding up your end of that deal and to assure you that the President and the Vice President are committed to doing that as well. And, and so am I, and look forward to continuing to work with you and, and your leadership uh, in the coming months. It's going to be a challenging fight, but we're up for it, and we're going to keep our work going. Thanks, Harold. Thank